Um, so I thought we would go over the quiz today, take a little time to go over the quiz, talk about um, the problems that were on there. Um, and I, I think actually multiple choice is often harder because you're presented with answers which are close to the right answer but not the right answer. It can be a little tricky sometimes. Um, so I thought we'd go through that. On the test next week, uh, there will be similar kinds of topics and questions, not necessarily multiple choice, but certainly things comparing different um, structures, looking at the relationships between things, naming things. Uh, so it's important that you understand these concepts. So let's take a look at the quiz. Uh, I'll go through these one at a time. So for the first question, it was about hybridization. Uh, and I think uh, there's still some confusion about how to tell what the hybridization state of an atom in a molecule is. And I've indicated here uh, the carbon attached to the oxygen here, double bonded to the oxygen. Um, and of course, in multiple choice, there's uh, four different options. Obviously, the first one couldn't be possible, right? It has to be hybridized if it's bonded in a, in a molecule. So just in general, when we think about hybridization of atoms, uh, why do why when they're in, within bonding within molecules, why would they hybridize? Why would they change from the atomic structure? It's because in order to form the most stable situation where all the bonds are as far apart as possible in the three-dimensional structure and accommodate all the bonding to that atom in the right way, we have to have different arrangements of of what the original atomic orbitals were to create new orbitals in the bonding situation. And so that's what I want you to think about. Um, if, and I can, I can break this down a little bit and, and sort of uh, explain this in a maybe easier way to determine this. Because you can look at any organic structure like this, and the, the carbon I've highlighted, for example. Um, what you would need to do is identify the kinds of bonds that are bonded to that atom. And so we have two kinds of bonds in organic molecules. Um, in addition to empty orbitals and, and lone pairs, uh, we have two kinds of bond, covalent bonds that can form. Sigma bonds, okay, which are an end-to-end -end overlap, and that's what makes up all single bonds. You can read that, it's a little small, sorry. So that's what makes up all single bonds. So, if you have a carbon that has only single bonds to it, four bonds and they're all single bonds, how many and what kind of bonds do you have? You have four sigma bonds, right? Okay, and then if we have double or triple bonds in a molecule, the only way to do that is to use pi bonds. Side to side overlap. And the only way to make a pi bond is to have that bond made from what was it originally a p orbital from the atom. Okay, so sigma bonds, sigma bonds, I should also say here, sigma bonds are hybrid orbitals. They have to be made of hybrid orbitals. Well, I guess that's too simplistic of an answer. For, for most purposes that we look at in organic structures, that's the case. Um, pi bonds, have to be unhybridized P. So in this case, what you need to do is think about with four total bonds, what made up those four bonds has to come from the original four atomic orbitals and then be recreated into something new for the bonding situation. So when we start with a valence shell for a carbon or an oxygen or something like that, the orbitals that we have to start with is 1s orbital and 3p orbitals. Okay. So if you have four sigma bonds, it has to be made up from those original four orbitals. So what do you think the hybridization would be? 1s and 3p's, that's p3. If you have a pi bond, like is the case with this carbon, we have three sigma bonds and one pi bond, right? Does everyone see that? So there's a single bond here, which is a sigma. There's a single bond here, which is a sigma. The double bond, is always made up of first one sigma and then one pi. So there's a third sigma here and then one pi to make the second bond. So if we have three equal hybrid, uh, 
three equal sigma bonds and then one pi bond. To make that bonding situation, we had to keep one of these out for the pi. And the rest are hybrid orbitals, three orbitals made up of what's left. So the hybridization has to be sp2, because it's made up of one, three bonds made up of one s and two p. So does everyone understand that and how to look at the structure? Figure out what kind of bonds there are and what you had to originally make it up. And in this case, if the answer was sp2. Okay. How about for this carbon? What's the hybridization of that carbon? Well, how many bonds are there? Uh, remember, don't forget the hydrogens, which are not drawn. There's a, there is a, a, a single bond to a hydrogen. Three sigmas and a pi, so it has to be sp3 and then one p over the left over. So I'm sorry, sp2. So it's the same, sp2 hydridization. Okay, how about a triple bond? How about a carbon of a triple bond? SP. SP, right. Because it has two sigmas, one sigma here and one sigma here, binding between the carbons. And then to have the other two bonds, they both have to be pi bonds. So two sigma and two pi. The only way to make that up is to have two p orbitals that leaves behind for hybrids only one s and one p. Okay. If you still have trouble with that, I would recommend going through the problems again. Um, uh, the end of chapter problems that were optional on the OWL system are available for you to work through. And I think I can make it available, the homework problems that you've done already, I'm looking at how to make it available so you can redo those, not for credit, but for practice. So hopefully I'll have that up done this afternoon. Okay, any questions on hybridization? This problem one. Okay, uh, acid-base concepts. We talked a lot about acid and base concepts. I just uh, chose to uh, ask a question about Lewis acids and Lewis bases. So what's the definition of a Lewis acid and Lewis base? Anybody? Uh, not a proton acceptor. Well, proton acceptor is a definition of a bronsted lowry base, it's a specific. It still fits within the broader definition of Lewis base, but the broader definition is it's a lone pair, electron pair donor is a Lewis base. Electron, oops, that's not electron. Electron pair donor. Okay. And a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor. It's a broader definition, which, which is about forming covalent bonds. So if you look at these uh, four examples here, what's the only thing that would have a lone pair of electrons to donate? So this is why you have to understand Lewis structure as well. ALCl3. ALCl3. Uh, where is aluminum on the periodic table? Right below boron, right? So it's to the left of carbon. So how many valence electrons does aluminum start with? Uh, valence electrons. Three, and it forms three bonds. There's not a lone pair. It's empty, just like boron right above it. Okay, so the, the only molecule here that has a lone pair would be the nitrogen-containing molecule. So the, when you look for Lewis base, is something to think about. Uh, actually, because this has an empty orbital, it's a Lewis acid. Aluminum trichloride is a Lewis acid. So is the boron trichloride. Okay. Uh, the way to identify a Lewis base is look for lone pairs. And the most common elements we use in organic chemistry with lone pairs are nitrogens and oxygens. Okay. That, can, that usually accept uh, bonds uh, and donate its lone pair. Okay, any questions on that one? 
Okay, naming. Uh, this is a naming problem. Uh, and so you had to look, there are several examples of structures given, and you need to find the one that matched the name. I hope this wasn't too difficult for you. Uh, but so the first thing to look at when you're when you're given a name is what is the parent name? And notice the parent heptane here means seven carbons. And there's only, right there, you don't need to look any further. Right there you should be able to answer this question because there's only one molecule with seven, with something with seven carbons in the, in the molecule as a parent, right? And the other thing to notice here again, look out for this, the cyclo part. So cycloheptane uh, has to be C. You don't even really have to identify where the substituents are. It's the only, uh, only uh, uh, one given to you that has a cycloheptane in it. So. But let's go through the name. So 1,3-dimethyl. So that means there are two methyl groups that are separated three carbons apart. Actually, there are two molecules which have that situation. This one and this one. Oops, I should be here. One, two, three. Okay, so you can see one three dimethyl and then the one chloro here for the other substituent that's attached there. Does anybody have problems with naming? Uh, okay. Let's uh, take a look at the next one. Now, I, I like these problems, so you probably see some on the exam, where I'm showing you a couple of different molecules and saying, what is the relationship between them? Okay, are these the same compound? Are they, what, what kind of isomers are they? Are they just a conformation? And so, you have to really understand what those concepts mean to be able to compare and look at two different molecules and see what the relationship is between them. So in this case, I have several options. Uh, two molecules, they're both cyclohexanes with two methyl groups on them, drawn in a couple of different ways. Uh, they could be stereoisomers, conformers, constitutional isomers, or they're just completely different. Okay. How about the molecular formula? Is it the same or different? Different. They're not different. They have the same molecular formula. So obviously it can't be, oops, sorry. <coughs> obviously it can't be B. They're not different molecular formulas. The same molecular formula. They have the same number and kind of atoms. Um, that's what we refer to in generally as an isomer. They have this two molecules, they have the same number and kind of atoms, but somehow are different. They could be different in two different ways. They could be different in how the atoms are bonded to each other. In other words, the skeleton of the molecule is different, so different atoms are bonded to different atoms. That's a constitutional isomer. Or all the same atoms are bonded to the same atoms, but they're arranged differently in three dimensions and stuck there, Okay, so that they are different because of their position in three dimensions, but still bonded to the same atoms. In this case, uh, the, the way to do this one way to do this is to look at determining the IUPAC name for the molecule and comparing them. If the name is the same, they're the same molecule. If the name is different somehow, you can see if it's different with one of our stereochemical terms or with one of our, if it's numbered differently, then it's a constitutional answer. So in this case, uh, C was the correct answer because this one happens to be a 1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane. And this is a 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane. So the methyl group is actually moved to a different atom on the skeleton. That's a constitutional isomer. Okay. Uh, also, of course, you need to understand stereochemistry, so uh, being able to compare these. Uh, for this problem, hopefully you recognize that and that they are constitutional isomers. What about the stereochemistry for these two molecules? I've shown? What is the designation for the stereochemistry of the relationship between the two methyl groups on that one? They're both up, so it would be cis, right? 
cis 1 3 dimethyl cyclohexane. And the other molecule? It's also cis. They just happen to be both pointing down. Cis 1 4. That's the difference. 1 3 versus 1 4. Okay. Um, you have to be really careful and examine the structures of molecules uh, carefully when you're comparing two molecules. Because again, you could represent it on the paper in many different orientations and they could be exactly the same molecule, but look differently because I've turned it around or, or flipped it upside down here versus there. Um, and you have to really carefully look for what are the actual differences and what, what's the same between the molecules. Uh, did I go back too far? Okay. Uh, all right, primary, yeah, question? Okay, yeah, the difference between a stereoisomer and a conformer. A stereoisomer is actual isomer. There are two different molecules that can't interconvert. But they are bonded the same, but just positioned differently, like a cis versus a trans. A conformer are just two rotations of a molecule that you're comparing. But they can rapidly, they can, they can interconvert. There's no barrier to interconverting so like them. It. So like a chair flip, or a single bond rotation around a butane conformation or something like that. Those are conformations. That's not something that we, we see. The, the molecules aren't different because um, they're interconverting. Okay? So conformers are just motions of a molecule, not actually changing the structure or three dimensions permanently, so it can't change, can't uh, convert. Good question. Okay, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary hydrogens. Um, we indicate these, I don't know, some, uh, I think there are some questions about what this means. That degree sign, the one degree means it's a primary, um, and it, we're talking about the degree of alkyl substitution. So if it's a secondary carbon, we would use this symbol, and a tertiary carbon, we'd use that symbol. Um, so just to clarify that, because I think there are some questions about that. But um, primary carbon. So what does it mean to be a primary carbon? It doesn't It's only attached to one other carbon. That's right. It's only, it only has one other alkyl group attached. Okay. A secondary carbon would have two alkyl groups attached. Okay. So if you're a carbon and you're bonded to just one other carbon, what are the other three bonds? Hydrogen. So the thing to look for is do you have CH3 groups? That would be a primary carbon. So in this, uh, these examples, the only molecule with CH3 groups is this one. So those are CH3 groups here. Uh, so that's the only molecule that has any primary carbons in it. All the other molecules have uh, either secondary carbons, um, well, I guess I shouldn't have put carbon tetrachloride down there. That's a little confusing. Because it's not attached to other carbons, technically. It's not attached to hydrogens. We te we're generally looking for hydrogens on those, but... Anyway, this, these are all secondary carbons. Um, when you have sp2 or sp hybridized, we don't use this terminology or indications for primary, secondary, tertiary. It's just for SP3. That's something else I don't think was clarified before. Uh, but regardless, none of these have only one carbon attached. Okay, acid base equilibrium. Something else you need to be uh, aware of and, and have some idea about. Uh, so I've shown you here an uh, equilibrium reaction between an acid and base on one side and a conjugate acid and conjugate base on the other side. And I've shown you the, the, what, what serves as the acid on either side of the equation. I've given you the pKa value. So the pKa for phenol is 9.9 .9 and the pKa for methanol is 15.5. So first, what does pKa indicate about the acid? the strength of the acid. And so if the pKa is higher, the acid is 
weaker, right? The acid is weaker. And by weaker, we mean less reactive. By less reactive, that means it must be more stable and lower in energy. So I want you to connect all of those things. Weaker, less reactive, lower energy, more stable, and obviously the opposite of that, or stronger, more reactive. The lower the pKa, the more reactive or more acidic. And so a reaction, any reaction, if it's an equilibrium reaction, wants to go to the most stable state. So the lowest energy state, the weaker state, the less energetic state, so that's the right side of the equation. Okay, so those are the things you look for in an acid-base reaction. If you know the pKa's, then you should know um, uh, which side is the reactor side. Uh, how many people had trouble answering this question, given the information here? Because the pKa, having the pKa there should tell you uh, right away, which is weaker, which is stronger, and which side the reaction lies on. What if I didn't give you the pKa? What if I left that information out? How many people would not have been able to ask the question if I left the pKa out? I thought so, yeah. Um, obviously, knowing those numbers, knowing those numbers is very important. Um, for a chemist, understanding what structural features uh, make an acid stronger or weaker compared to another one uh, would help you understand this reaction equilibrium even without the pKa's. Uh, although I probably won't, I'll give you the pKa's uh, in any questions I ask. Um, but just for your information, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, structural features which make something a weaker or stronger acid, right? Uh, delocalization or spreading out of the charge, like this one can spread out, so that would be a more stable species relative to this one, the anion part, for example, on the, the base and conjugate base part. Um, those structural features, if you understand those concepts, that can give you a clue also about these kinds of questions. Yeah? Um, do we need to know the values? You don't need to. No, you don't need to know the pKa. You don't need to memorize the pKa values. Uh, just know relative pKa's and what they higher or lower and what that means. Yeah. Will we ever have to figure out pKa? Uh, no, I won't have you figuring out pKa. Um, if I gave you two, well, I will. I will give you questions with the pKa if you have to answer these questions like that. Yeah. So don't worry about that. Um, torsional strength. We've talked a lot about structures of molecules and, and what, what leads to changes in energy as the conformations are changing or rotating from one to another. And there are several types of strain associated with linear molecules and cyclic molecules. Um, and so one in particular I asked here was for torsional strain. And torsional strain is which one? Electron repulsion between bonds. That's torsional strength. Okay? Remember we talked about as, as ethane molecule rotates, so the hydrogen on one carbon relative to the hydrogen on the other eclipse each other. The torsional strain goes up, so the energy goes up. Because those electrons in the bonds are repelling each other because they're coming closer. So it's electrostatic, electron, electron repulsion. Um, this one is an even a strain. Staggered conformations aren't a strain; it's a conformation. Uh, but the other two are another uh, two other types of strain energy. So when atoms come close to each other and bump into each other, what's that called? Steric strain. Yes. And when we have a bond angle that's being forced to be different than what it wants to be optimally to spread out, that's what we refer to as angle strain, yes, angle strain. And in any molecule, there's some combination of these types of strain that leads to the overall energy of a particular structure, uh, whether it's a specific conformation or specific structure. All these things come into play to various amounts, depending on the difference in the structures. Um, so be aware of the different kinds of strain and energy in the molecule. OK, any questions about? Uh, the quiz, and we spent a lot of time going over this, but I think it would be helpful for your exam. Yes? Um, this isn't really about the quiz, but I'm just curious. Um, 
benefits, but like also like it has to be you need to know like um, what the female group and isomeral and all the special ones. Uh, the, so for naming of the tests, right? Uh, so for the test, you should know methane, ethane, propane, butane. You should know the basic parent names through the first test. So do we need to know like those special ones? The, like the, the special ones, isobutyl, secbutyl. I won't be. I won't be doing. I'll just be doing normal substituents with ethyl, propyl, things like that. So don't worry about those common special names. I won't be asking that. Yes. Um, I hope it will reflect the concepts. I might ask them differently than the homework, uh, but certainly the homework problems are this, the same concept. So I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, they probably won't be structured exactly the same as the homework, but definitely those problems will help you understand the concepts. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and in a few minutes after we. Finish the, I have a few more things to say about Chapter 3. I'll, I'll just remind you of some of the topics for the exam that you should make sure you hit. So let's uh, talk about the chemistry then. We were talking last time about reactions and, and the way we think about reactions, the types of reactions, and that um, most reactions are polar reactions where we have some electron-rich species, which we call nucleophiles, reacting with some electron-poor species. Uh, an electrophile, and we talked about the fact that reactions such as this one, addition of an electrophile, which happens to be HBr here, the electrophile adds to the double bond of an alkene. Um, and it's, it's uh, important to think about these reactions in terms of each step along the way of the path, and then thinking about what's happening in each step so we can really understand the chemistry as it goes along. So the overall reaction here, alkene plus HBr gives this bromoethane molecule. Um, that overall reaction doesn't tell you how it got there. And we as chemists really want to understand how these things take place step by step, and we have a lot of different ways to talk about how reactions take place, um, thinking about reaction mechanisms. And so if you, if you imagine a reaction, right, these are molecules which are coming close to each other and then changing their bonding situation. So you have bonds breaking, you have bonds making, and this is a continuum from two isolated molecules uh, and as they approach each other, reactions start happening and bonds start getting longer and bonds, other bonds start forming. Um, you're going through different energetics of a reaction. That affects how fast a reaction occurs and the overall, um, overall energetics of the reaction in terms of bonding at the start and bonding at the end. And we, we can think a lot about the mechanism of a reaction, describing it in terms of a reaction energy diagram as we're going through this continuum of molecules coming together, doing bond changes, and then forming products. Okay? And as you can imagine, if you're breaking bonds, it takes energy to do that. You have more reactive, higher energy species along the way, um, and you have to overcome a barrier. And I have a picture on the next slide to show that energy diagram. But remember these terms. The energy required uh, to overcome the energy barrier along a reaction pathway is an activation energy, the, that highest point along that energy diagram. Uh, if you have reactions which are more than one step, uh, then you have a possibility of which of those steps actually is determining the overall rate of the reaction to get from starting material to product. Uh, and whatever is the highest energy is going to be the slowest. And again, I make the analogy to trying to ride your bicycle over a mountain. And if you have, if you have three mountains in the way, um, the slowest way to get there, if you get to the top of the highest one, then you can just zoom down and over the other ones, right? That's how you kind of think about reaction energy pathways as well. Getting up to the highest mountain is the, is the uh, one that is the slowest. So rate determining step is the one with the highest activation energy. And then 
however these molecules are interacting or changes taking place at that highest energy point, we call the transition state. It's, it, obviously, if it's a highest energy, it's not going to exist for any period of time. So it's not an intermediate. That's different than an intermediate structure. Um, so in this uh, example of a reaction energy diagram, this is uh, describing a reaction where we actually do form an intermediate. Notice there's a little dip in this energy pathway. Uh, so B here is sort of like a local minimum along the energy path. Uh, reactions go from A to B to C. And so in this reaction that's described by this reaction energy diagram, we have some starting material A, or starting materials. It could be multiple starting materials, like alkene plus HBr would make up A in this case, if we do that specific example, which goes to some intermediate B, and then B converts to C. C is the final product. Okay. Um, this, this would be described in the reaction energy. So which, which step in this reaction, A to B or B to C, is the slowest step? It should be obvious just by looking at the graph, right? It's A to B, the slowest step. And I even <laughs> written it there, so you should be able to answer that. The slowest step in the reaction is the one with the highest energy barrier. So we can say this is the rate determining step. RDS is the first one when we think about details of a specific reaction pathway. Um, this actually is important when we think about what things are present. What is the concentration of these various things in a reaction as it's proceeding from starting material to product? If we're starting with A at the beginning of a reaction, and the time it takes to go to C, What's all present during that time? What is the concentration of those species that are present during that time? This can give us a good idea because once you get up to the highest energy point here, that's slow. This is going to be fast. Right? Going to B and then to C is going to be really fast and will not determine the rate of the reaction. It will happen essentially instantly from once you get to the highest energy. Now, as you do the reaction, let's say a reaction takes an hour to convert all of your molecules of A into C. At the beginning of the reaction, you have a 100% concentration of A. At the end of the reaction, you have a 100% concentration of C. As the reaction proceeds along, how much of B do you have at any given time? Would there be a lot or a little? So those are the kinds of questions we can ask and analyze using a graph like this. So if you really think about this, um, uh, let's say you start reacting A and it's forming B, but as soon as B is formed, what's happening to it? It goes right to C. Okay, B, does, B is an intermediate, but its lifetime is going to be kind of short because as soon as you get to B, it's going to continue on to C. So the amount or the concentration of B at any given time during the reaction is not going to be that high. You're going to have mostly A and then gradually going to C. B will be at some probably slow, low state along that reaction. And those are the kinds of things we as chemists really think about when we think about these reaction mechanisms. And it's probably more details than you'll ever need to know. Uh, but again, I want to get you thinking a little bit about what is, what is this information really telling us? Um, one aspect that's very important uh, is related to that energy barrier. And uh, many people have heard the word catalyst, right? A catalyst. What's a catalyst? Yeah, it speeds up the reaction. And, and a catalyst is used in less than uh, stoichiometric amount, which means it's less than one equivalent. Okay? And the other important feature of a catalyst is it something that helps speed up a reaction but is not changed during the reaction. So it's not part of the product or, and it's not changed during the reaction. It's used to change the energy of the pathway, uh, but in the end of the reaction you have that catalyst molecule back. That's why you don't need the stoichiometric amount. 
because it's not it's not destroyed or it's not reacted. It, it may be helping some steps in the reaction, but then you're recovering that. Okay. Uh, and this energy diagram kind of explains what a, what a catalyst might be doing in a reaction in a very generic way. You have a reaction, uh, A going to B, which has this energy barrier, the amount you have to go through. So the catalyst lowers the energy of the reaction by creating another pathway for it, which is, which is smaller energy barriers. It may be going through an intermediate or several intermediates to do that, and that's okay. But overall, the energy barrier to get from A to B here in the cat with, with a catalyst present is lower. Okay. And again, I've shown here there's uh, several steps. There would be three steps along the way in this particular generic example I've shown you. Um, that's what a catalyst does, and why are catalysts important? They speed up reactions, and they're, they're super important in, in biology because without enzymes, enzymes are catalysts. Without enzymes, a lot of the chemistry that happens between biomolecules wouldn't happen. Um, they make reactions possible to make proteins, to do whatever uh, reactions are happening in your cells. So enzymes are biological catalysts that uh, do amazing things to make reactions happen that wouldn't otherwise happen in your cells. But the reactions that without a catalyst, you know, if you have to heat it up to 800 degrees Celsius or something, right, your cells aren't going to survive that. So uh, biology has uh, allowed then these catalyst enzymes to develop to actually do the chemistry that happens. So, yeah. Is it the heat a catalyst or just adding energy to the reaction? Well, we're not adding energy to reaction. No, what, what is yeah. heat? Is heat Oh, heat is it. Heat is an energy. No, heat is energy. So it's just adding energy. Yeah. Because heat doesn't change the rate, doesn't change the speed of the reaction, only allows it to be possible. Well, and it changes the speed because if you don't get up here, you won't get to the product. Right? Like boiling water. Yeah. Yeah. So catalysts. Um, and obviously there are a lot of important aspects of catalysis, and that those of you who are going to go on and take biochemistry, you'll, you'll be talking about catalysis, I'm sure, quite a bit. Um, for synthetic chemistry and other kinds of chemistry, we have well-defined catalysts that we use to help with a lot of different reactions. And we're going to be talking a lot about acids as catalysts for reactions to make things possible. So an important thing about catalyst is if you have Intermediates or molecules in a transition state, uh, they are high, high energy and reactive, and to get there is hard. There's a big energy barrier. So can you get to something which is lower energy by using a catalyst to make it easier? Okay? To increase the reactivity of something so that uh, you can get that uh, to a place where you want to. One example, which we'll probably spend a little more time talking about details in the next chapter, is a reaction with a double bond. Um, the addition of hydrogen to an unsaturated molecule like alkenes uh, is a difficult process. Like if you took ethene and hydrogen gas and mixed them together, uh, I think you could heat it up very, very, very high and nothing would happen. Okay? The two molecules don't react with each other uh, under even extreme conditions. The only way to do this is with a catalyst. But you notice I put, I put a little bit of information here about the overall energy of reaction. So do you know what enthalpy refers to? Delta H or gives free energy? Sometimes there's some relationship there. That's the difference in energy from this, the materials on the left side of the reaction to the materials on the right side of the reaction. So that's, if I... If I go back to this slide, what I've indicated here is delta G, uh, delta H is about the bond energies that would be this difference. Okay, so if it's negative, bond enthalpy is negative 136 kilojoules per mole. What does that tell you about the starting materials versus products? Products are lower in energy, right? So actually, in this reaction, it is downhill. 
from the starting tools of the product. But there's a huge energy barrier to get over. So we need a catalyst. Um, and one of the big things to do here, we know that um, pi bonds we can do reactions with, and they are reactive enough, for example, HBr addition, as we mentioned. Uh, the, the difficult thing here is breaking apart the hydrogen-hydrogen bond to get that to be something reactive. That bond is pretty strong. And we need a catalyst to help break that apart. And then the catalyst hopefully will also help bring the alkene together. So uh, there are certain metal catalysts, and again, we'll talk a little more details about this uh, in the next chapter. Uh, but a catalyst, in this case, palladium metal is an often used catalyst for this particular reaction. It uh, is basically embedded on a solid support, graphite, basically carbon. And then what it does is it actually lowers the energy of splitting the hydrogen-hydrogen bond and helps bring the alkene into it. So it also templates, uh, interacts with the alkene, brings them together so that the hydrogens can then be transferred to the carbons. And it then that lowers the energy barrier through some of these intermediates that get formed, like palladium hydrides and carbon palladium bonds um, and things like that. So that's an example of how catalysis uh, really can help. Um, so that's, that's, that was introduced in this chapter. We'll talk a little bit more about reactions in the next chapter. Um, and this, this was actually the end of chapter three. Uh, I'm not going to worry about asking questions about hydrogenation in this chapter. We'll save that for more details later for the test. Uh, but I did want to take a few minutes and just talk about the topics on the exam. Um, so just to remind you, and I've, I've really summarized them in a short phrases here, a uh, short uh, list. Um, but there are, there's quite a bit of information in each one of these. So chapter one, bonding and hybridization. We talked a little bit about the quiz uh, questions with hybridization. Um, so you need to know details of hybridization, uh, but overall bonding. So what are some of the things we've talked about in terms of molecules bonding together? They want to become more stable. Sure, they want to become more stable. What kinds of bonds are possible? Sigma bonds, pi bonds, and those are examples of what kind of bonding? Covalent, right? Sharing of electrons. There's another kind of bonding, ionic bonds, which is electrostatic attraction of ions. Um, and and uh, you want to make sure you go back and take a look at uh, some of those details. I think the end of chapter, there's a like a summary at the end of the chapter, each of the chapters that have like bolded words highlighted for some of the main concepts. You might want to make sure you go through and look at those uh, and that you have an understanding of those concepts that are bolded in the end of chapter summaries. Um, acids and bases. Uh, we talked about Lewis acids and Lewis bases, uh, but the, we didn't uh, say too much about Bronsted Lowry acids. So what's the definition of a Bronsted acid? Proton donor and proton acceptor. Yes, proton donor and proton acceptor. That the donor, the proton donor, the one that has gives up a proton, is the acid and the acceptor is the base. Okay. Now in order to accept a proton, what do you have to have? A lone pair of electrons to accept that proton. Okay? Like things with oxygen, like things with nitrogens that have lone pairs available. Okay, so if you have a reaction, an acid-base reaction, we talked already about pKa's, right? Strengths of acids and equilibrium between uh, proton donors, proton acceptors. Uh, there are some terms we refer to uh, for those species in a reaction. So what is a conjugate acid? Isn't it the result of the product with acid changes too? 
That's right. It's the con. So on on either side of a reaction of acid base equilibrium, you have an acid reacting with a base, and on the other side of the equation, you have the products of those. So what was the base originally gets the proton. So it has the proton on the other side of the equation. So it's now the conjugate acid that has the proton. And think about that. The conjugate would be to go to the reverse direction. It would be what would be playing the role of acid and base to go in the reverse direction. And I've seen a couple of ways in which people think about it, this defining those. Um, one way, which, which can be a little confusing. So one way is, however you've written the reaction, whatever's on the left is the acid and base, and right is the conjugate acid and base. Uh, but uh, that's not really correct. It's whichever direction the reaction lies on. So if the reaction lies on the right side, the acid base is on the left, and the products are on the right. Those are the conjugate acids and bases. If the equilibrium lies the other direction, the conjugates are always the products. So the conjugate acid and base would be on the left side, and the acid base would be on the right. So acid and base are the reactants. The conjugate acid and conjugate base are the products, and that's the, the best way to think about that. OK. Let's see, any, anything else on acids and bases that we need to know? OK, um, in chapter two, we really started to talk a lot more details about alkanes, cycloalkanes. In particular, I think where you might want to uh, spend some time is looking at what we've talked about for confirmations. And I think that's an area where uh, people have some, it takes some time to understand those concepts well. So look at the rotational isomers of ethane and, and butane and things that I had in my slides. Understand that those are single bond rotations that are occurring rapidly. and We're looking at frozen snapshots at any particular orientation. And what happens to the relationships between the groups on the front and the back? Um, and in terms of cyclic compounds, Confirmations, I think, were most important. We spent the most amount of time looking at the cyclohexane, the chair structures. So it's important that you review the material on uh, what is an axial position versus equatorial position. Okay, what uh, what is the implication of having <coughs> groups attached on a chair structure in in which ring flip might be lower or higher in energy? Okay. Go back and review that, that's important. Um, be familiar with what the structural representations show you. So if, if you look at a Newman projection or a sawhorse projection of, a, of an alkane, and the same thing with the chair structures, what does that picture really mean? Now I, I don't think I'll have you actually trying to draw chairs this time, um, so don't worry about that, but certainly be able to recognize the positions on it uh, and understand the relationships. <laughs> go on between the chair structures. Okay, and then uh, we did introduce the topic of functional groups, and we've talked about a few of them, um, but just recognize the definition of a functional group is something that's reactive on a molecule that's similar to all other molecules. Uh, okay, anything else on chapter two? Details that uh, I'm missing. And of course, we've talked a lot about naming. So make sure you know the naming rules and how to name molecules. And understand how we represent them in different ways with line drawings and condensed formulas and things. Uh, in chapter three, this chapter, we started talking about specifically alkenes and alkynes. Um, and as we reviewed a little bit today here, how we think about reaction mechanisms and reaction progress. Um, and also realize how we represent reactions with curved arrows for showing electron flows. Um, yeah, those kinds of things. Um, I, I don't know that I'm going to be asking anything necessarily about the specifics of electrophilic addition on this test, because chapter four really delves into this in more detail. So any questions on uh, the topics for the test? Yes. How many questions, well, how many questions are on the test? 
How many questions are there? It's hard to say because it's combining multiple things, but I mean, it'll be overall 100 points with eight or nine different kinds of questions, probably something like that, which are multiple parts. Something like that. I don't know exactly yet. I don't really know yet. Okay. Yes, questions? Um, we need to like draw something where we have to draw the curved arrows if you're like doing the um, curved arrows. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to put that on, so maybe. <laughs> you will need to from draw structures, so uh, I can imagine there will be questions on, uh, I'll give you the name of the molecule, I want you to draw the structure and vice versa. What's the, what's the name from a structure? Uh, be prepared to do both. Okay. So if, you, if you're not used to drawing them out by hand, uh, you should practice <laughs> so that I can read them properly. Question? Um, do you want us to be able to no, you don't need to draw hybridization, you just need to be able to recognize it when in a structure when you see it. Good question. Okay, how are we on time? Ooh, spent a lot of time. Okay, well, I just want to start introducing chapter four. These concepts also reinforce the alkenes um, and reactions from chapter three, so uh, this will probably help you too in the understanding for the exam. Um, so, in this chapter, we're really delving into more details on different kinds of reactions um, for molecules with pi bonds between carbons. And so, we talked about this uh, briefly, this reaction, which is the addition of HBr to a double bond. In this case, the simplest of all double bonds is ethene. Um, and recognize, based on the concepts that we've talked about already, that the double bond, the pi bond of the alkene is the electron rich part, and that's the reactive part, the nucleophile in this first step of the reaction. Um, we know this is a stepwise reaction. There are a lot of different experiments which have been done to determine overall the mechanism. And so if I were to draw some details of this, uh, I would draw the electrons from the double bond to the hydrogen. When I draw it that way, it means that the pi bond is breaking and then forming a bond to hydrogen with those electrons, and that can only happen to one carbon. So the intermediate here is the one where that's the new bond that we've added. Okay. And then we're left with what behind? Yes, yeah, so a positive charge. So these two electrons are now in this bond that I've highlighted there. What's left behind is a carbon with an empty orbital and a plus charge. Okay. What we call a carbocation. Obviously a cation on a carbon. Carbocation. Okay. The other Thing that's left after these two molecules come together and the proton is transferred is the bromine. Okay, that's what's left. And oftentimes, we as organic chemists get a little lazy when we draw reactions and we, we assume that you know that there's a bromide there and you might not write it or something like that. So be aware of that. I may slip into that at some point. Um, but that is the other part here. The bond between hydrogen and bromine also broke in order for that proton to transfer, right? So the bromine takes those electrons and becomes a bromide. The second step of the reaction is the electrons, the Br minus, forms a bond to the carbon, and you get the carbon bromine bond formed as a second step. Okay? So, one way to think about this um, initially. So we have an H plus and a Br minus. Now they are covalently bonded typically as HBr, but uh, we can think about this as an H plus. So we reacted with something plus first, and then we reacted with something minus second. Now I want you to think about that in that general way, because this becomes a general concept for adding other things to double bonds besides H and Br. Okay. Think about what's plus that's adding and what's minus that's adding. Okay, here's the uh, energy diagram for this reaction. 
which shows you a lot more details, thinking about those different mechanistic aspects of the reaction as the reaction proceeds. So we start here on the left with our starting materials, alkene plus HBr, and the overall sum of the energies of those is, is here as the starting materials. We go to an intermediate, and actually I should say what I left off here is the bromide. So that's part of this intermediate complex you know, state of a reaction. We go to this intermediate through an activation energy uh, barrier. And the first step in this reaction has been determined experimentally to be the slowest step. And so we know that energy barrier is higher than the energy to go from here to the next transition state. So the, the reaction is slowest from this first step. So when, once you form the first step, the second step happens quite rapidly, and you get the bromide attack, the double bond, just like I showed previously. And then you form the product. Okay, so here I want you to relate now the specific reaction steps with the energy diagram. Uh, understand then what the diagram tells you about the reaction. Okay. Um, okay, well this is all fine and well, and it, it reacts okay with um, ethene to form bromoethane as the product. Uh, but we should have some uh, more understanding about the reaction. Uh, and when you carry out the reaction now with multiple different examples, uh, for, for example, this happens to be one butene, one butene, that reacts with HBr just like ethene does. Okay? The double bond is a functional group. It has the similar reactivity in whatever molecule it's in. Uh, so we react HBr with ethane and then if, with butene. And if we do that, we observe something very interesting. So in this case, the double bond is no longer symmetric. Okay? It's unsymmetric. So one side of the double bond has different substitution than the other side of the double bond. All right, uh, and in that case, there's the possibility of two different products. So if I were to think about how that reaction proceeds, right, the first step is addition of the HBr to the double bond, right? So we grab the proton, and that proton could go on either end of the double bond, possibly, right? So the, the proton could go on the end, like I've shown, I'm going to highlight it here. Okay, and then Br minus, that will add to the plus charge and form the product. That product gets formed, if we yeah, isolate that molecule, we get about 80% yield in that reaction typically um, for that product. Well, the structure on the right, if you if you knew that mechanism that we just showed on the previous slide and what I've again shown here, well, you should ask yourself, how come we don't get the product where the hydrogen is added to this carbon, leaving the plus charge there? Okay. In that case, bromine would add here and we form that product. When we actually run the experiment, we don't see that product form. And that's when we say, why is that the case? What is important for directing the reaction to one pathway versus the other? Okay. Uh, and then the other question you should ask, that's one other experiment, one butene. Is this general or is this something specific with one butene? This is how a scientist that answers and tries to think about answering questions about what's happening in the world. Uh, in fact, if you look at other examples, you see some. You see a trend happening here. Look at uh, two propene, two methyl propene. Two methyl propene forms only one product. Again, two products could be formed from this. In this case, the hydrogen added on the end, and the bromine added in the middle carbon. The other product that was not formed would have been. I'll highlight the hydrogen. Hydrogen there and bromine there. That wasn't formed. Okay. Well, you get that result and you say, does it have something to do with having 
a double bond with two hydrogens on it? Well, no. Here's, here's a methyl cyclopentene. And again, we see a selective reaction where the hydrogen is added specifically to one point, the product that I showed here, and not to the other, which we would predict where the hydrogen would have added here and the bromine here. That's not formed either. So what seems to be the general trend we're seeing here? Uh, well, the hydrogen, uh, the original double bond, I'm not sure what so we mean by that. On the middle one, the hydrogen goes on the end because that's, I don't know, I don't know what I'm saying. Right, it's not the number of hydrogens, but it, it is clear that the number of different substituents on the double bond matters. Okay, that's what's being shown here. It's not specifically being on the end of a chain, because even in the middle of a chain, that's not symmetric. In this case, it happens to be a cyclic ring, but you can see there is something substituted here, but there are two substitutions here. There's one hydrogen already existing there, so the product actually has two. Okay, so the general trend is the H plus is adding, the hydrogen is adding to the side with the more hydrogens, and the bromine is adding to the side with the least hydrogens. Okay, and that's... Uh, an observation that was uh, made quite a long time ago by someone named Markovnikov. And he came up with a rule. He, he, he had these empirical data, he tried many, many examples of double bonds, did the reactions, and noticed this trend and said, ah, in a case where we have an alkene, when it's unsymmetrically substituted, an acid will react with that to put the hydrogen on the carbon with the most hydrogens and the halogen on the carbon having the fewer hydrogens. Okay. Well, that's a rule which explains the experimental results, but it doesn't really explain why it chooses, why it, well, it doesn't choose because it's not sentient, why it goes that way. So why does it go that way? Uh, by the way, when we refer to a reaction that's selective like a double bond has two different ends, and we're getting so only one of the possible products where it's on one side or the other. We refer to that as a regioselectivity. Selectivity for one region. Um, and I had that as the title of the previous slide, so that term is what's referring to this. Regioselectivity. Okay, so isn't this a little puzzling? Now the question is, why does it do that? Not, we have a rule that states that it does that, and we can use that rule to predict, but it doesn't explain. Okay. We need to have an understanding of why to be able to explain it. So any ideas? Hydrogen slightly negatively charged. Hydrogen are slightly negatively charged, maybe. And remember, we're adding, and that's why understanding the steps in a mechanism will really matter. That's why I went through this several times now. The first step, H plus adds and forms an intermediate. And then that intermediate uh, reacts with bromide to form the product, or chloride, or whatever you're reacting. Okay. Well, it has to do with that intermediate and the stability and structure of the intermediate that's formed. So we should really talk about the nature of these reactive intermediates like the carbocation. Okay? In terms of hybridization, remember hybridization occurs to form the, the most number of bonds, the hybrid bonds with electrons that are as far spread apart as possible. If there's an empty orbital, if there's an empty orbital on an atom, there's no electrons in it, there's no electron repulsion, the other three bonds will be hybridized and spread out. In one plane, a carbocation is sp2 hybridized, just like a double bonded carbon would be, because that empty orbital isn't having any electron repulsions. There's no electrons in it. So if we think about this, here's an example of what we would refer to commonly as a tertiary butyl carbocation. Um, tertiary butyl, what do you think the terp stands for? Yeah, the carbon is attached to three other carbons. So that's the example I showed, showed you the structure uh, showing the 
structure with double carbons. It's actually flat in one plane. Here's the p orbital that you can see in this in this orbital model or another model. That's the structure of a carbocation. Okay. So clearly, one of the things that we observe when we carry out those different experiments is that the intermediate that's formed during that reaction, the carbocation, if that plus charge was on one end or the other end of where the original double bond was, it have a different number of alkyl substitution. Okay. That relates to the number of hydrogens, right, or carbons attached. So if you think about the carbocations, a carbocation, let's just look at what the trends are. So the simplest of all carbocations would be one carbon or a methyl carbocation, a carbon with three hydrogens on it, okay, and an empty orbital. There's the structure with P orbital shown there. Um, if you substitute it with one methyl group where you have an ethyl carbocation, okay, how does that structure relate to methyl? Or you continue along the way. You have a isopropyl carbocation or a terbutyl carbocation. The degree of alkyl substitution increases from methyl. Uh, this one would be a primary because that carbon is attached to only one other. Here the carbocation is attached to two carbons, so it's a secondary carbocation. See how we're using this terminology now? That's why you should know it. And in this one, we have a tertiary carbocation, a carbon with a plus charge attached to three carbons. Okay, and what, what's been observed is that the relative stability or the overall energy, the energy goes down, the, the, the carbocations become more stable as you go to the right. So the more substituted a carbocation is, the lower in energy and more stable it is. And that's really the important feature which dictates how the electrophilic addition to a double bond will occur because of the stability of the intermediate carbocation. This shows you the electrostatic map of those methyl, ethyl, isopropyl, and tertiary butyl carbocations. There are several, uh, a couple of important things. Why would that carbocation be more stable with more groups on it? Well, is, as much as we can spread out charge and help fill that empty orbital with electrons in some way or some nearby electrons, the more stable or lower energy it will be. So with the methyl group, you can see it's largely colored blue, purple, because it's very concentrated, high positive charge. As you start to put alkyl groups on there, you notice you still have uh, bluer in the middle where the carbocation is, but you have some, uh, or do some lessening of that blue color. Uh, one of them is an inductive effect. So a carbon-carbon bond will form um, well, in the single bond, you do have some electron delocalization of the single bond donating towards the plus charge to help alleviate it. Carbons do this better than hydrogens. So the, the more carbons you have, the more of this inductive effect you have on these atoms. Uh, the other thing is, notice that this bond, here's the p orbital, I'll draw the p orbital here on the carbocation, that's the carbocation. Notice this bond here, one of the bonds adjacent can align with it. Usually if we have two bonds aligning on one carbon to the other, there's electron-electron repulsion. But what do you think would be the situation if you have electrons in one bond and an empty orbital in the other carbon? It's a good thing. It can help to, to lower the amount of plus charge. And he, this shows you some, some representations of that, where the electrons are helping also to neutralize some of that charge a little bit on the carbon itself. That lowers the energy and makes it more stable. So the more groups you have on it, the better it will be. The more stable it will be. That's the reason why 
the more substituted carbocations are more stable. Um, we're going to finish there. We'll have the exam on Tuesday. We're going to talk more about this next Thursday in more detail in these reactions. Uh, there is an SI session tonight at 5.30 in Lab 114. Um, I will be available most of the day on Monday. Uh, so feel free to stop by if you have questions and get some help. All right, have a great weekend.